Hey, good morning, everybody. Well, Trust and Obey is one of my favorite hymns, and Chehi is one of my favorite places, maybe my favorite place at this point in life. I look forward to it each year, and it's a genuine and consistent highlight every time I'm here. Well, happy 4th of July, everybody. Yeah, very cool. With regard to American Independence Day, we often hear the phrase, freedom isn't free. Consider this, if freedom isn't free, what is the cost? Does such a concept exist in or apply to Christian faith in any way? And if so, how so? That's what we're going to try to find out. So uh, I want to speak on bondage and freedom, or bondage or freedom today, uh, and kind of make some comparisons and contrasts. Lead to, uh, I want to share a little bit about my own life and how I've come to understand this topic based on my experiences, things I've seen, places I've been. And then we'll walk through some scriptures, um, and I hope you'll at least jot down the references so you can go back later and maybe string them together and develop uh, your own deeper thoughts about it. Um, I am not a theologian. I've not been to a seminary, but I really try to support scripture with scripture, and that's what I want to do this morning. So let's begin with Reverend Wesley White, who we miss so badly, but for whom we rejoice as he celebrates his great and untimely homegoing. And we celebrate that too, even though it's difficult. Wesley White's ministry at Upper Room Church in Glasgow, Scotland, has been used in amazing ways over the years in freeing Muslims from their various types of bondage. The spiritual bondage of Islam, the familial and social bondage of strict obedience to an oppressive religion, to the point of disfigurement or death inflicted by disrespected fathers, or other unspeakable abuses, even at the hands of imams, the Islamic leaders these people are supposed to be able to trust. And if you've ever heard him speak in smaller settings, he doesn't talk about this um, publicly with us quite so often, but in, in smaller settings, he will tell you some of the horrific things the immigrants of uh, fleeing Muslim lands who end up in Glasgow have suffered terrible, terrible things. We must be grateful for the difficult work to which he was so committed, work that has brought many to Christ, and we must pray that it will continue in Wesley White's absence, and then we should support it as we are able. I've had my own times of Christian service overseas. Some of you might know that after eight seasons with the Continental Singers, visiting over 40 countries in all parts of the world, I moved to Seoul, South Korea in February of 1989 as a self-supporting missionary for Continental Ministries, which is a non-denominational Christian music ministry that at that time was based in Thousand Oaks, California. They're based in Rotterdam, Holland now. I lived in Seoul for nearly 14 years, quickly becoming able, by God's gracious provision, to turn that work over to Korean nationals as I joined the Korean National Symphony Orchestra as a horn player. But let's back up a bit to my very first summer tour with the Continentals. I had become a Christian in the early summer of 1980. Um, some high school friends uh, led me to Christ. And this was right before uh, my first year of college as a music ed major at West Texas State University. Um, so some years in college, and I was active in my church there and, and trying to uh, understand what it was like to be a Christian. I didn't have specific discipleship. I didn't know to seek that out, and no one had offered it. Um, but I was trying. Uh, and in the summer of 1983, I thought I wanted to do something this summer. It was the summer before I was uh, to be a graduating senior. I had originally considered traveling with a drum corps, and back then a group called the Blue Devils was the top tier group. Um, but I had also recently learned of the Continentals. So as an eager young Christian looking for a way to serve God with music, I sent an audition tape, a cassette tape, in an envelope via mail. That's how things were done back then. Uh, to the office, and they ended up uh, assigning me to a group called the Continental Orchestra, 
which was a, a full-size orchestra with a rhythm section and eight solo singers, kind of their top-tier group. So I think I had a good audition. Um, and we toured to Holland and Germany, as well as our uh, various stops in the United States. In Amsterdam, we were the in-house orchestra for Billy Graham's conference for itinerant evangelists for a week. And I actually got to shake hands with Billy Graham and George Beverly Shea and be on stage with them every day for a week. And it was, I didn't understand at that time what an honor that was uh, and what a great privilege. After our time there, we traveled to what was then called West Berlin. Um, I think very few in this room were, were born <laughs> uh, while all that was happening, were alive then. But West Berlin was a free and modern enclave in the heart of communist East Germany. Berlin was in East Germany, but the city was divided, and there was a single narrow highway that ran uh, across a very heavily guarded border from West Germany into, into West Berlin. It was the only way you could get there, and you had to have special visas. Um, but we got there, and it was... Uh, Pretty interesting. It was a very modern city, but also very um, punk rock oriented at that time. And the youth were very disrespectful um, and loud. And it was, it was interesting for me as a little Texas kid. Our third day there in West Berlin, with all our visas and appropriate paperwork in hand, we walked through Checkpoint Charlie. Anybody know that? that term. If you've studied some history of communism, Checkpoint Charlie was the one spot between uh, West Berlin and East Berlin, not the, not the only one, but the, the best known where anybody with the right paperwork could cross into East Berlin. And it's like razor wire and guard houses and machine guns and pretty scary. Um, so we crossed into East Berlin, the communist side of the city. Our group, our orchestra, Nearly 50 of us was ridiculously conspicuous, um, dressed as Americans do, as we navigated <clears throat> by paper map, yes, that's what we had back then, through dingy, narrow alleyways to a secretly prearranged basement location where about the same number of Christians, about 50 people, were waiting to meet with us. And that was a big risk on their part to do that. We spent a few hours with them praying and worshiping together, unexpectedly, loudly, and openly, uh, and rightfully concerned that the gathering might be discovered or disbanded by state police. When it was time to go, and it was hard to do that, and they, they wanted us to stay, but they knew we couldn't, and we wanted to stay, and we knew we couldn't. We had a, a curfew to get out of the city. Uh, but there was a, a great amount of joyful weeping and expressions of truly deep gratitude, deeper than I'd ever seen in my short 21 years of life. Many of these persecuted families and individuals secretly following Christ where it was illegal to do so had never met a foreign believer. And they were so thankful to know that they had support in their faith from beyond the Berlin Wall. We knew as well as they did that while we could walk back to the safety of the West, some or all of them could be jailed or worse for having met with us. But their pastor's words to us were something to the effect of, been there, done that. Meeting you was worth whatever we might face. Both the Billy Graham Conference and the short time in East Berlin were powerful, pivotal events in my life. On top of that, the program we were performing that summer was a Dove Award-winning musical written by our executive, executive director, Cam Floria, on the life of Joseph called The Dreamer. And that entire musical is available on YouTube if you want to watch it. It's fun, it's um, poignant, and it's, a, it's a, a complete story of the life of Joseph uh, and the victory he won for his own family in Egypt. Not only did I play horn in the production, but I also played the stage part of Benjamin, Joseph's younger brother, who narrated the story with a very early form of Christian rap. <laughs> <laughs> Want to hear some? Yes. Yeah. Of course you do. <laughs> Climb Jacob's ladder to the family tree and you'll find a lot of sibling rivalry because Joey's dream caused quite a storm and things at home were getting warm. So my ten big brothers went south a ways to give the sheep a better graze. Daddy told Joe, go see your brothers in the south, but he should have made a muzzle for Joseph's mouth. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, that's, that's been a long time since I've done that. Uh, Joseph suffered the bondage of slavery in a foreign land in Egypt at the hands of his own jealous brothers. The, music, the musical powerfully came to reflect to me, meeting third world evangelists in Amsterdam, some from Muslim and communist nations, most very poor, and the Billy Graham Association had actually paid for all their flights and all their room and board. This was thousands of preachers uh, from poor countries around the world, and they paid for all of that. And there were actually, um, the following year, there was another, uh, no, actually three years later, there was another itinerant evangelists um, conference that I was, again, part of with the Continental Orchestra. That event, plus meeting the dear Christian brothers and sisters uh, that we had to leave behind in East Berlin, um, still rings in my heart. It was very impactful. And it frequently convicts me in the comfort of my 21st century life. Well, after the tour, I returned to Texas. Um, my life deeply changed, and I needed to finish up my college degree and start a teaching job at Pampa High School in the Texas Panhandle. A dear lady at my church at that time ran a great program for evangelizing Texas prison inmates, and she uh, contracted me to be a staff writer for Bond and Free, the newsletter of that ministry. One of my first articles was about the spiritual freedom I had witnessed in the Christian community in East Berlin. People that were surrounded by walls and guards and state police. And they were so free. They were so free to worship and pray and study God's word, even under the strictest of potential disciplines and punishments. This week, in our Chamberfest Brass Morning Devotionals, we've been studying Daniel, who, like Joseph, ended up in a foreign nation against his will. He was a young man captured in Jerusalem and hauled off to Babylon to be re-educated to serve in the king's court. Yet, like Joseph, he too remained faithful to Jehovah God, free in a difficult place. Besides Joseph and Daniel, many other Bible principles are known to have been bound, enslaved, imprisoned, tortured, and some ultimately martyred. In Hebrews 11, the great hall of faith chapter of the Bible, Paul lists some of the expo exploits and blessings of a few of our greatest Bible heroes, stating, by faith, so-and-so did such-and-such. -such. At the end of the chapter, he makes this startling contrast. But some were tortured refusing to accept release from prison so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging or chains and imprisonment. They were, sto they were stoned. They were sawn in two. Who was sawn in two? Anybody know? Hebrew scholars will tell you that it was Isaiah. It was sawn in two. Or they were killed with the sword. They went about clothed in animal skins, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, saints of whom the world is not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains, abiding in the dens and caves of this earth. A well-known example of bondage in the New Testament is the account involving the Apostle Paul himself and his companion in ministry, Silas, as they were thrown into prison. In Acts 16, 16 to 34, Luke recounts the incident. Santhi, if you would stand and read the passage very loudly for us all. It's a long passage, so pay attention. It's a good one. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, they, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. 
And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet to the, to, in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the fa foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the man that, that the prison doors were open, he drew he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all who were in the house, in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them into his house, and set food for them, before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So here's the questions, and you're welcome to answer it out loud, and I hope the answer is obvious. In this account, who was truly free? The jailer. The jailer. And so we come to our, our application, and there are several scriptures here that you might want to jot down references for. The Word of God is filled with passages about freedom. And many of them provide a direct definitional or applicational, meaning behavioral, contrast to bondage. And I think you'll hear that in some of these. Galatians 5.1 states, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, in the contrast, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Whether we stand firm in freedom or submit to bondage, we make the choice. From historical and socio-political perspectives, for example, uh, slavery in the United States, we can understand the ramifications of being enslaved again. It will be worse for the slave. In Matthew 12, 43 to 45, Jesus offered a spiritual equivalent. He taught this, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through arid places seeking rest, but finds none. So the Spirit says, I will return to the house from which I came. When it arrives and finds the house empty, swept, and put in order, it brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last, and the state, the last state of that person is worse than the first. Corruption breeds even worse corruption, and the sin-sick soul is further enslaved. An early and obvious clue in our lives that we are bound to sin is when our relationships become tense or awkward because of our own discomfort, our own guilt, our own shame. Even in something as simple as how we speak to each other, or if we continue to speak to each other. But 1 John 1.7 reminds us of this truth. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with who? We have fellowship with who? You know the verse? If we walk in the light, as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But what is fellowship? Well, you've heard that it's not the Wednesday night potluck before the prayer meeting or a basketball game in the church gymnasium or even the, the name of the room designated for these activities. Fellowship instead is a spiritual intimacy among believers. I'll say that again. Fellowship is a spiritual intimacy among believers. It is those deep and sometimes difficult conversations. It is weeping with one who hurts or rejoicing in the successes and blessings of others or offering the humble, prayerful rebuke when one we love has strayed. It is the way we treat each other with honor with respect and with a love that understands that everyone we meet has an eternal soul. 
with one of only two eternal destinations. Here are some other verses to guide us as we pursue a life of freedom. 1 Peter 2.16, live actively, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, that's called hypocrisy, but living as servants of God. Galatians 5.13, you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve who? One another. Through love serve one another. Finally, to bring us back to our opening question, does the concept of freedom isn't free apply to the Christian faith? Jesus in John 8, 36 said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The gifts God has given us through Christ, they're ours, we possess them. And we squander them, and we ignore them. We don't have to. They're already ours. Christ has set the believer free, and the cost was his dignity, his body, his blood, his very life breath. The cost for us, as we have learned from examples, the examples of Joseph and Daniel and Paul and others, could very easily be persecution. This happens far too frequently in many parts of the world and it's occurring more and more in the comfortable sphere of the West. If we do not understand the true source of freedom, we will not be in a good position to keep it if persecution comes. If we do not understand the true, the true cost of freedom, that for which Jesus suffered and which so many Christian martyrs have been made to suffer as well, then we will fear what could just as easily come to us. Let us embrace our holy freedom and honor Christ's incompre incomprehensible gift of eternal life by being obedient to God's will, that is, to his word. The application to which Nate alluded in sing time on Tuesday is obedience to God's commands. It is cultivating a pure heart, one not prone to the lusts of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. It is serving someone instead of indulging the self. It is pri prioritizing God at every turn, whether we want to or not, whether we think it's necessary or not, or convenient or not. Freedom comes by actively, continually honoring the sacrifice who has become our living hope. The application does, does not always seem easy, but our Savior is always there when we step toward him. I'm not saying that what we do saves us. We will never accomplish enough, nor can we ever be good enough, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And only by grace we are saved through faith. And even faith is not our own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. What I am saying is that our good works should be the natural response to loving God for his immense and perfect glory, demonstrated, demonstrated in loving the people we know, and even strangers, as we remember the prodigal son, who are all made in the image of God for nothing less than their eternal souls. James 2, 14 to 19 addresses the issue of faith and works. He says, what good is it, my friends, if someone says they have faith, but do not have works. Can such a faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and you tell them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Likewise, faith by itself, if it does not have the proof of works, is dead. And some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, but I will demonstrate my faith by my works. This clearly seems to indicate a works proves faith teaching to me, yet some do see this as pointing to a works based salvation. Not true. Because Jesus said this very clearly too in the parable of the sheep and the goats. Adam, would you stand and read loudly Matthew 25, 31 to 46, please? on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, 
Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into the eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So, the believer's freedom is found in doing the will of God, in fulfilling the two great commandments, the summarized commandments, which Christ taught us in Mark 12. Love the, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, by the power and guidance of your Holy Spirit, help us, draw us into living our freedom, into living the gifts that you have given to us, into putting ourselves last in the equation, into worshiping God first, worshiping the Holy Father with all our hearts, and in looking to our brothers and sisters with awareness, with discernment, to be encouragers, to be need meters, to be helpers, to be those who speak truth, those who speak the word, and those who speak salvation. We look forward to the day ahead. We look forward to the ministry of this weekend uh, of worship through great music. We want to send that to your throne as a fragrant offering and sacrifice, but we want our parents, our family and friends, and each other to be encouraged as we worship in the service of the Levites with really great music. Guide us through this day toward that end. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.